Welcome to Mind Garden. We're going to talk about the network state. By the way, the book is freely available online at a link that I'm sure you'll tell us about. So thanks for bringing this up. I'm actually really interested to hear what you have to say about this and what we can do. Yeah, uh, I'm really interested to talk about it. It's a book that came out earlier this summer. I think the published date was like uh, July 2022. Uh, became a Wall Street Journal bestseller, which I don't actually know what that means, but they said it, so I'm assuming that's impressive in some way or regard. Um, it's, I think, something of a controversial work, or at least the author himself is somewhat a controversial figure, but I think the ideas in there are pretty interesting. I'd love to you know, talk about with the greater uh, neighbor and junior community. Um, I will go ahead and provide a disclaimer that I am not responsible for, no advocate any form of anarchy, archy, or deviations thereof, and a nice little state machine to figure out if your form of archy applies. Um, so who is responsible for anarchy? It's a good question. Like, is there an organization? <laughs> uh, within this jurisdiction, I imagine the FBI at the very least would get involved, so that would be fun. Um, so we'll go ahead and present this as kind of a summary for discussion about what a future could hold in terms of advancing innovation and humanity. Or it might just be some random ramblings from this guy who will eventually subside with time as the world continues to turn. Or something in between. Uh, so I'll go ahead and ask for reader and listener discretion. Uh, request it, but you know, at the end of the day, you do you. <laughs> no qualms here. Um, the author is involved with a lot of blockchains and cryptocurrency, but I, I'd imagine this, this will focus less on that than you might otherwise expect. Um, maybe we have to have, and I only have about, you know, 20, 30 minutes of material presented because it will be more of a summary. Um, maybe you definitely feel free to delve into tangents to the top, side topics there. Uh, but this isn't necessarily about blockchain or cryptocurrency per se, but that is certainly discussed as methods of implementation, so implementation of some of the concepts discussed. Um, uh, so, kind of highlight the author a little bit, who's Balaji, uh, Balaji Srinivasan, I think is how his name is pronounced. Um, I think it could be objectively said he's probably a decently smart individual, you're a PhD, uh, well, I bachelor's, MS, and PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford, and apparently picked up a chem uh, MS in uh, chemical engineering for kicks and giggles along the way as well. Uh, he founded Council, which is a uh, genomics testing company in 2007 that was later acquired, uh, started a company called Earn.com that eventually got acquired by Coinbase in 2018, uh, and at the same time became CTO of Coinbase, and he left one year and one day afterwards, so I'm assuming he was just itching to keep going and do his own thing, uh, but he was... Uh, from what I understand, a decent contributor there during that time period. Uh, he also joined uh, Andreas and Horowitz, also known as A16Z, as general partner back in 2013. Um, because there are investors, you don't have to believe everything I'm about to say, so. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, but Kirk may actually mentioned he was formerly a partner, so I'm not actually sure if that's his current state, but. Yeah, I couldn't see when he possibly left, but Wikipedia has him as formerly, so. Okay. Um, I do know he left Coinbase in 2019, like I said, he published the Network State in 2022. Most of his recent actions have been as an investor or angel investor advisor of some sort, and also something of a public figure. Um, he is known to be very critical of legacy media and bureaucracy, and particularly the FDA, which that to stand, I think, comes from his time as in genomics testing. Um, just trying to give an idea of some of the biases that he might have and that, that we might have come to discuss discussion. Uh, so, what is the network state? The, uh, the you know, title of the, the work we're discussing. A network state is a highly aligned online community with a capacity for collective action that crowdfunds territory around the world and eventually gains diplomatic recognition from pre existing states. So, clear as mud. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on, his, on his book page, he actually has a network state in one sentence, and I'm guessing that's the sentence. This is the one sentence. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, oh, actually went backwards. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this definition. There's a further expanded versions of it, so but maybe we'll try and go into some definitions and details. Uh, so, states and nations. A state is a form of human organization comprised of four essential elements. and. Uh, I think everything in here we can argue in a semantic argument about, uh, but 
you know, obviously we're trying to have general discussion in terms or general agreement on definitions for the most part. Uh, we can always get definitions <coughs> what things actually mean some other time. Um, and so we define it as having territory, population, sovereignty, and government. Uh, plus or minus there are some other aspects we can talk about. But I'm going to argue the definition for population. Uh, it's the same territory. It's just a typo. That is a typo. <laughs> Um, you have to go back and figure out what that was. Population probably just a group of people within said territory. Yeah. Something like that. Um, so then, if that's a state, what are nations? Nation states. A nations are a large body of people united by common descent, history, culture, or language, usually inhabiting a particular territory. And again, there's probably going to be edge cases there as well. A nation state, uh, Paul G. argues, is a homogenous nation governed by its own sovereign state. Each state contains one nation. Um, and it's argued that rarely do, nation, rarely do nation states in their proper meaning come to existence, and also they tend to be fairly new. Uh, it was argued, or it's argued in, in the work that the concept of sovereign states emerged in 1848 with the Treaty of Westphalia that led to this concept of uh, sovereignty that nations uh, can form and not be messed with or disrupted by other outside influences, or at least they shouldn't be. Um, and it's argued that the first nation state, France, came about following the French Revolution in 1789 that was formed on the basis of being a nation. Um, I'm going to say I'll pry a little bit over my skis in terms of history, and there's, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly how much I can follow or argue for, for or against some of the, the historical claims here, but again, it's kind of a summary of what biology presents here. Uh, it's then argued that, you know, technical innovation form the foundation for making nation states possible. You look at things like the Gutenberg Press that was formed in the 1400s, enabled vast populations to develop this common sense of culture and common language. Uh, things like mass vernacular newspapers that came out uh, that laid the basis for the nation as a result of the readership, sharing, collective experience of the news and their current reality, irrespective of pro physical proximity. When we say physical proximity, like relatively, instead of having to be in the same village or the same you know, particular area, you can be entire countries. Although, obviously, in that time, it was still uh, within the realms of pragmatic distribution of printed word or spoken word, as it were. Um, but yeah, irregardless of that relative physical proximity or even social status, that everyone started becoming, uh, consuming the same narratives and collective experiences. Uh, continuing forward, you can then argue that technical innovation starts to become the foundation for what, it, what our network states. So you have internet producing, uh, digital native communities, global and borderless commerce, and even new vernacular languages forming new collective experiences. So those memes, we all see, mean something. We're, we're making history here. <laughs> As the internet gives way to digital communities, uh, we argue that cryptographic currencies form a stateless asset management layer and then other abstracted layers on which uh, we previously need to have physical or analog um, uh, methods or processes but now we can have uh, these abstracted layers that can be uh, managed cryptographically and statelessly and all be trusted and verified and all that stuff that you know every good crypto bro is going to throw at you. Um, and so then as the internet gives way to new companies and then new communities and the new currencies, it's argued that the next logical step is that you can then start to form new countries in the form of network states. So again, what is the network state? A highly aligned online community with a capacity for collective action that crowdfunds territory around the world and eventually gains diplomatic from pre-existing states. I think it'd be pretty, uh, pretty easy to, to come to consensus that the first two kind of clauses there already exist. We have highly aligned online communities. Um, I mean, look at subreddits, at Twitter, Facebook. You can find groups that tend to be very highly aligned. Um, the second bit, capacity for collective action, which seems to be coming about, if you're familiar with the concept of Wall Street bets and some of the concepts of market manipulation that are alleged to have occurred on behalf of those, those groups. You can look at things like, for example, um, recently there's an NFL football player who's hospitalized, um, and as a result, his charity was donated to as a means of like people wanting to pitch in and help. He now has one of the largest charities in the NFL overnight, and he's still not conscious yet. <laughs> Since you're doing good, so we'll, we'll there. Um, and so we're, we're starting to have this capacity for collective action. Although uh, you could be argue that you know the the capacity for organizing, directing that collective action is still in the works. 
Well, it seems like the collective action now is mob action. Yeah, it, no. it's not very, um, I guess, centrally directed, I suppose. No. Yeah. Um, but then you could argue these last two clauses are definitely things that have not happened quite yet, or at least not mainstream. Crowdfunding territory around the world. And I think the last one is definitely the moonshot here, gaining diplomatic protection <coughs> from the existing states. Uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with like the Matrix series of comics and the, the, the um, fictional world that kind of developed around the movies, but if you've ever looked at some of the... Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think about how to do this without actually spoiling some of the concepts for those who haven't seen it, but the idea is that eventually a new nation forms outside of humanity, and a lot of the, the work there is the fight from humanity against uh, recognizing that, you kind of see co correlating concepts here as well. Yes. Are the pre-existing states uh, online states as well, or even um, like United States? I think the uh, it's like pre yeah, you had anything like a UN recognized nation. UN recognized nation. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's interesting because like I don't know that I don't obviously to do the first two mm -hmm. we don't need the second. Yeah. Right, and so I'm curious. Specifically about the crowdfunding of territory. Mm -hmm. I remember when I heard that concept, and I wasn't, I haven't quite got a good answer as to why that's necessary. Do you have insight into what? You I think it's necessary as a foundation if you want to do later steps. But there's certainly implementations in network states that don't necessarily need to go that far. Um, and there's also implementations in network states that would not require it, but <coughs> would make things much easier. So like one example would be a network state where there's an ideology around, um, say, how you dress. You want to have a nudist colony in the form of a network state. Then obviously it's probably going to be a lot easier with a well-defined territorial boundary than you know, individual apartment buildings spread, out, spread across the country, for example. It's one example they gave. Or maybe a less extreme one would be, they call it the keto kosher colony, where processed foods and sugars are simply not allowed. But how do you enforce that? It's much easier to enforce it within a collective territory. Hmm. Physical territory. Physical territory. Yeah, when we say territory, usually physical. Is it, sorry, is territory a prerequisite of sovereignty <coughs> as well? Uh, like true sovereignty. Yeah, that's, that's the thing I, I question. And also, is this crowdfunding a territory? Is it, we can crowdfund this territory here that's part of network state A, and this territory over here on the other side of the world? is also part of network state A. Yeah, so there's that idea, there's, there's cohesive and contiguous territories, um, and then you could argue within territories of existing physical states, like on land, you know, Wyoming or in the middle of the desert or something, or you have international waters, seasteading, things like that. Um, can, can territories be a part of two states, or never, only ever part of one state at a time? Uh, I think by definition, how he starts out is it's expected that you'll have territories being part of two states. One is a physical state that exists already, and the other is a network state that begins to form. Um, I still have to, I can't shake the idea that the only reason we need to crowdfund territory is for the last step. But existing states will not recognize you unless there's territory. As far as like an absolute requirement, I think that's the only thing that comes off the top of my head, yeah. I'll try and keep thinking about that further. Uh, I had a similar thought uh, to Kirk piece, which was, you know, if, if the goal is the last step to be recognized as a state by the pre-existing states, maybe it's not, but if it is, it seems like what would be even more important than territory, some sort of centralized control. Because I don't know if like pre-existing pre-existing states are that interested at all in you know recognizing or dealing with a network state that would be as random as you know like especially if we're talking about like that things like you know weapons or money markets or something like that like it seems like. Anything that doesn't that isn't something that like a existing state could negotiate with is going to just be viewed as a threat. Period. I think it depends because I mean, you look at the state of Wyoming currently has an API for which you can then form a decentralized LLC. So in that case, you can deal and form entities without having to deal with any centralized entity. 
either from the state or from the decentralized organization's perspective. And whether that can continue to lead into actual network states is something to be argued. Um, but yeah, definitely something to think about, Matt. Um, as far as like having a centralized figure, we can go into kind of the expounded definition that, that biology gets into. And this one, this is where concepts seem to become much more opinionated, become more this specific Balagian vision of what a network should look like. Um, so in, in this quote, he says, a network state is a social network with a moral innovation, a sense of national consciousness, a recognized founder, so there's your, your centralized figure uh, in, in his terms, a capacity for collective action, an in-person level of civility, an integrated cryptocurrency, a consensual government limited by a social smart contract, an archipelago of crowdfunded physical territories, a virtual capital, and an on-chain consensus that proves a large enough population, income, and real estate footprint to attain a measure of diplomatic re recognition. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so that kind of reinforces the in instant guide last time that the real estate footprint is to measure, is for diplomatic recognition, right? I think to some extent, but if you look at like a nation state like Singapore, for example, it has a relatively small real estate footprint. I mean, it does exist. They do have one, but it's much more smaller than compared to the, the population density and the income that they control. So I think it could be argued that, um, you know, even one or even two of these can be expanded and scaled large enough to diminish the lack of the other one, but maybe some fundamental granular amount of all three is required. Certainly population, but with the other two, I'm not sure. It could be argued either way. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's completely possible to sort of network states in general, um, but I think it's, it's possible definitely to have disagreements with biology's view over what properties network states should have. Especially if you're not um, you know, a crypto bro or crypto convert, it's hard to see why an integrated cryptocurrency is so fundamental part of the network state. I think maybe that's more clear. He argues portions of why that's, if not required, definitely desirable within the book. Uh, but I think arguments can be definitely made to have to be had with incorporating network states without necessarily having an integrated cryptocurrency or some of these other concepts that he argues for. Um, but again, the book goes into more depth in arguing each of these individual points, I believe. Um, and so, kind of, to go back to the high level of what the book itself is about, it seems like there's really two books in one here. One is gonna be this grand uh, treatise, treatise or uh, work on how the world works, um, Vitalik, who's the, the uh, creator of Ethereum, describes this as an exposition of Balaji's grand political theory, which comes across as his why, why this should occur and why it needs to happen. And the other part is the constant network states and how they could have made more of the how. Um, the rest of the presentation, most of the presentation in general focuses more on the how because the why tends to, uh, I think, be much more subjective to Balaji's worldview and how uh, since the world works uh, and gets much more political. So I'll also add that Vitalik, that, that, that Vitalik, is that I think it's Vitalik, Vitalik. I, I don't know. Anyway, it, it, as a creator of Ethereum, he very much, Ethereum is not just a cryptocurrency. It's, it's part of what Ethereum, Ethereum is a framework for having uh, contracts, having contracts that are stable. And that's, if you go over the previous slide, that's actually a requirement for a network state. So if you think about, think about like the constitution, in the United States is our ultimate contract, right? And, and how, how you govern relations with everybody is, is a contract um, thing. And so Ethereum was actually built for that, as well as the cryptocurrency. Cool. Uh, any other questions or comments? Cool. Um, so talk a little bit more about his why, and we'll get a little political here. And again, this is biology's worldview. Um, so he, to take from uh, Thomas Hobbes' works Leviathan, that was printed you know, a few hundred years ago. Um, Leviathans are essentially what Thomas Hobbes considered the prime mover. Like, if you have two kids on a playground, they start throwing each other, and eventually you get to the point to where my dad can be up your dad, and their would be their Leviathans are their father. Like, they're the ones that if nothing can beat them, like everything's enforced by them, it's everything. So, Balji considers the three Leviathans the fundamental prime movers to enforce pro-social behavior within a given society starting out with, with God and religion in, uh, you know, prior to the 1800s, and then eventually leave on to the state, 
uh, and then followed by what is now emerging as the network. So with God, it's don't punish because it's sin. It, don't steal or don't do something bad because it's sinful and God will find you and punish you. With the state, you don't steal because the state will catch you and punish you. The state is all powerful and omnipotent and has absolute jurisdiction. And his argument with the network of Thiathan is that with concept of cryptography, you can't steal because you lack private keys or you'll be detected by a network AI that is omnipotent within its realm of jurisdiction. Um, and then he has a chart here that kind of shows his fundamental three players that he, he views represents these three Leviathans in today's, uh, in today's world with um, the United States having some sort of uh, moral energy and leading what he calls this woke capital or imperative of how to act in society, which he represents with the New York Times. You have an author authoritarian that tends to be economically central, but all controlling and powerful and very organized and uh, represented by the, the Chinese Communist Party. And then you have uh, Bitcoin as representing the network uh, that has, you know, uh, absolute love of freedom and uh, uh, use of cryptographic principles to enforce absolute action to where it, in what they view as evil is simply not possible. Um, and so the idea is that you essentially, in taking the worst of each of these three, you get woke capital versus authoritarianism versus crypto maximalism, uh, which leads to stagnation, dysfunction, and various forms and regards. Uh, but the idea in Balaji's view is that by taking, by having network states that are a decentralized center, that they can create a better alternative, combining the network love of freedom with the moral energy of the woke capital of the New York Times, the United States bureaucracy and the organization and capacity of the Chinese Communist Party to get the best benefits of all three uh, and avoid the worst parts. Um, so one thing is it's not trying to justify network states by using an abstract theory uh, you know, uh, from first principles, but instead trying to take things as they are and identify what the next step forward is in terms of advancing humanity and innovation. Um, so continuing on this why, um, there's a nice little web page from the founder of Stripe. Uh, this is domain site, patrickcollison.com slash fast. And you go there and you look at some of the things that humanity and institutions have done previously. For example, the P-80 was a shooting star, or known as the shooting star, was the first jet fighter used by the United States Air Force. It was designed and delivered by um, a Lockheed Martin, uh, their division known as Cutworks, within 143 days. Uh, so again, you like, I think everyone's, a lot of people are familiar with, you know, the kind of boondoggle of current military projects. They have 35 and current stealth bombers and Navy airplane, or warships and all that. It usually takes years to even get a working prototype. But to go from design rec specifications requirements to delivering a prototype on 43 is absolutely insane. To me, at least. Wow. It was back then. So. That's true. Eiffel Tower. It was built in two years and two months. It was the tallest building for 40 years. It cost $40 million. That's in 2019 money. That's not, like, that's after inflation. Uh, the Empire State Building. Construction was started and completed in 410 days. I mean, I've been at neighbor for about 410 days. <laughs> the Pentagon was designed in three days. They got the request on Thursday. Someone designed it, get, had the designs in, in, on Saturday. Then two months later, they started construction, and then it was finished five, 491 days after that. It is still one of the largest office buildings by volume capacity to this day. Um, wow. I got another uh, video here to show. Uh, this, a lot of people may have seen this already, but um, this is on an existing rail line. There are some constraints to make things, or not constraints, but things that make this a little bit easier. But this is a train station that was completed in China in nine hours. Just the rail part or the buildings too? Like easy station. So the rail already existed, yeah. They, they built the station. Oh. I don't know why there's no... Uh, oh, maybe it's because I don't have audio. It's just music anyways. Yeah, I want to say they build the platforms. Anyway, 
Yeah. Um, it was an existing rail line, so they stopped. I think the reason why they had to do it in such little time is it was a major artery, so they couldn't uh, afford stopping transit along that line um, during the day. But the fact that it was completed in, it was it nine hours? Using 1,500 workers, and I think they said 10 or something excavators. Uh, oh, this is not working. Oh, yeah, these are the images I was looking for. Compared that to the bottom two images, which uh, I'm sorry if you like the city of San Francisco, but they're kind of easy to pick on these days. So. Um, they have two great examples. For one, it took 27 years, $300 million. Do you know what that was for? Any guesses? Something lame, probably. It was a bus lane. Dad, a bus lane. 30 years? 27 years. Uh, like throughout the city? <laughs> uh, I think it was along like one street for five to ten miles. This one is also great. came up in the news. Uh, a little hard to read. San Francisco plans to spend two years and $1.7 million to build a single toilet public restroom. <laughs> it's going to be a, quite the experience in the restroom. <laughs> it's, I'm sure it's amazing. Uh, it's in something called the No Valley Town Square. Um, so I would really recommend, Biology's done a couple interviews on podcasts and for reference, he usually spends about three hours per podcast when he does this, so I'm definitely not doing it justice here. But to listen to his why and the experience he's had with bureaucracy and how things used to be compared to how things are, he argues that one of the best reasons for why we need network states is that it provides a clean slate on which to build and uh, innovate in, in different spheres. Obviously, doing physical innovation is going to be a lot harder in a network state, but the idea is that as these become more and more feasible, pragmatic, and accepted, uh, physical territory innovation can then start to occur. Um, but I think, well, we'll talk about that in some of the other examples. We'll talk about how steps towards that in, in later slides. Um, so going back towards the how and the concepts of what a network state is and how they start, um, you know, this is a little bit still the why too, but existing societies, nations, yada yada, have become ideologi ideologically entrenched and are failing one or more different facets. So they're unrepresented the people they govern. They're authoritarian, uh, they're unorganized, and or collective, uh, hostile to collective action. If, especially some, um, I think it's libertarian arms to where you have such demand for individual freedom that the, you then start to preclude yourself from being able to organize collectively. Um, so that hostility then uh, uh, starts to prevent you from that capability of collective action that the biology advocates as part of a network state. Uh, and then pure incompetence, uh, and he argues a lot of this extent with either legacy media, um, his, he has some great rants against legacy media to where you, you view them as networks that have been inherited and they're no longer built, and if you could put the same people that, that run these uh, organizations in a position where they have to then build something new, they simply cannot. They can maintain the status quo, if even that, um, but uh, unable to build and innovate further. Um, so they argue the easiest way to innovate is often by starting with a clean slate in terms of immigrants to a new country, founders starting a new company, or colonizers or explorers exploring and founding new cities. So then why not take existing technologies and utilize them to form a new society in the form of a network state? Um, and he then talks about, you know, what when you, we think about what counts as a country, what counts as a house of sovereign state. So for example, there are 193 UN recognized countries, 20% of them have a population of less than 1 million. 55% have a population of more than 1 million, but less than 10 million. Um, include things like Singapore and Ireland and New Zealand, they're you know, commonly known as pretty big countries, pretty big entities to deal with. Um, and how do networks match up today? So Facebook has, and these numbers might be a little bit old, but Facebook has, or at least had, 3 billion plus users. Twitter had 300 million users. Neighbor has, edited for YouTube, lots of <laughs> users. <laughs> uh, but then if you look at even individuals on those networks, they have 1 million plus followers. You look at you know individuals like, I don't know what he does, but Logan Paul and Mr. Beast, I think it's big. I don't know if he's big, but he's pretty big. Yeah, I heard he's pretty big. So, so the one in Nation. 
So I'd be interested. I imagine there's probably a large representative of Reddit users in this room. Like, cause I, I would think that we're looking at these, these are like technologies, mm -hmm. but the communities are actually separate inside of those technologies, right? So Facebook, um, there's a different community there. Yeah. Um, and just like there is under Twitter, you find people have their own, like I'm, I'm mostly AI Twitter, that's mostly what I subscribe to on Twitter. But so for Reddit, like what's the, like as far as the community in Reddit, like what's the largest Reddit community that you guys? Picks. What's it called? Maybe Picks or Funny. Okay, so just Funny and stuff? That's and how big is that? We're talking millions? We're talking million. tens of millions? Maybe. Tens of millions, definitely. Like gaming space. Or more community would be like our conservative or or liberal, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it definitely seems like there's a correlation between the smaller the community, the more, um, I don't know if loyalty, but at least affection, affiliation towards seems to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. The more ideological purity they require. Yeah, ideologically aligned. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Um, and so if, if we have ideological alignment that is, you know, more than... 10 to 1,000x some of these that are you know, considered traditional sovereign states, why could they not be considered you know, capable of collective action and then forming territories, even if it's on top of existing jurisdictions to where you have poly you know, jurisdiction, and then even negotiations in terms of false sovereign states. And so, uh, Balaji had given the network state in terms of one sentence and then an essay. This is the network state in terms of an image to where you have on-chain or, I mean, he says on-chain because he really likes to harken to cryptocurrency, but verifiable in some way, shape, or form, population, annual income, and square meters, uh, in addition to geographic location and proximity. Uh, and his argument is that you can form these using, to, uh, as opposed to like, there's other me methods of forming states that are like, obviously elections, and revolution, and war, and going to space, and seasteading all of which tend to either have pretty negative outcomes or require innovations that don't yet exist. His argument is that this is feasible and possible using current technologies that exist and putting them together and forming uh, collective action around that. Uh, trying to run a little low on time, so we'll kind of scream through these a bit, but they're in the summary version of this book, he talks about seven steps to actually go through the form a network state, the first being found the start of community or society. So an online community with aspirations just doing something greater, like a peer-to-peer -peer storage company, or a cryptocurrency, or a subreddit. Uh, he argues that legitimacy then follows from founding, following the founder. Wall Street Bets is 13.4. Dang. Million. Okay, I didn't wow. think it was that big. Yeah, wow. So they're twice the size of Ireland, or Singapore. Uh, step two, organizing a group of capable, organizing into a group capable of collective action, which he calls a network union uh, that coordinates members for mutual benefit, that turns otherwise ineffective online community into a group of people working for a common cause. Great timing, Matt. So, for example, Wall Street Bets community manipulating stock markets. <laughs> With 13.5 million people. Yeah. Or four, or whatever. Exactly. Uh, and one question I had is like, who decides what is mutually beneficial? And I guess initially it would have to be the founder or founders, and then um, legitimately followed by others continuing to follow, or you would then be able to opt out, uh, and then maybe some sort of on-chain or verifiable consensus later. Um, so step three, after network union, build trust offline in a crypto, community, crypto economy online. So again, uh, there's the question, why is a cryptocurrency specifically required here? Uh, but we'll continue going forward. Hold in in-person means in the physical world, and this could start as simply one-on-ones uh, for a drink at your uh, uh, neighborhood beverage facility, or in increasing the scale and duration, and then increasing the scale duration of these above over time, and then building an internal economy using cryptocurrency. And I guess one of the arguments for doing the internal economy with cryptocurrency is it starts to build legitimacy for the community itself, and you start to. Uh, have that ideological alignment in some way or shape or form. Um, step four, crowdfund physical nodes. Uh, and so the idea is that initial trust is then built and the funds are accumulated. You can then crowdfund apartments, homes, and entire towns. 
And this is actually already happening. So for example, 40 acres were purchased by Decentralized LLC in Clark, Wyoming, known as CityDAO.io. I looked at the land, it's a mountain and seems pretty inhospitable, but I think they're not planning on living on it. It's some sort of A, experimenting, and proof of concept, and a B, for conservation, with the idea of continuing to go forward. Uh, so then as you start to have a physical presence, you start consolidating digital systems in the physical world, living within uh, real communities. But that doesn't sound, if they're doing it in Clark, Wyoming, that doesn't sound sovereign. I think the idea is not, it, it would be an initial step to try and become sovereign eventually, but... It's, it's a physical node, that's the point, right? Yeah. So yeah, just starting to develop a physical presence. And then from disjoint physical nodes, you start to form a network archipelago, a set of digitally connected physical territories around the globe. Um, when scales range from one-person apartments to in-person communities of millions. Um, uh, physical access can be granted by cryptographic, cryptographic digital passport, and then you then start linking offline and online worlds using mixed reality. Um, I think the question is, did network stay in digital first? Why is the, like, need the mixing of mixed reality? But, um, yeah, I, I guess it would continue to lead credence and give um, legitimacy and weight to the network state over time. And so it, it kind of form these, this network from these disjointed and individual physical nodes as they start to become more and more uh, numerous. Having a military would be tough. Uh, so, I think we talked about that a little bit later, but the caveat is that you could argue that most countries in the world don't really have a capable military force, but they sit off contract to their local, I guess, Leviathan or Big Brother, whether it's you know, United States aligned, Russian aligned, Chinese aligned, or Indian, or you know, your next Big Brother country. So countries like Cyprus and Malta and, I don't know, maybe your small little tiny nation, they're probably not going to be able to capable of defend themselves against, you know, a uh, world superpower, but, uh, so if that's the case, why should network states be expected any less as well? And I think a big point too is that I don't think these are intended to necessarily replace a existing physical state by any means. The idea is simply anarchy to where we need to abolish the United States government instead of something new, but the idea is it gives you an alternative into which to opt in before which there was no option, and then having multiple network states then gives you the ability to opt out of other network states, and that competition inherits, or not inherits, but incentivizes continued innovation and prosperity for its members. Um, okay, I got 10 slides left. Uh, conduct, or conduct an on-chain census, so as the society sales, scales, running cryptographic, cryptographically audible census to demonstrate going scale, whether in terms of size of population, citizen income, and real estate footprint, and the legitimacy of the startup society gains traction in the face of skepticism. Um, and I think it's kind of easy to kind of dismiss this pretty easily in terms of like, oh, we're going to start a club and get a bunch of clubhouses and all of a sudden we become a country. But if you start to look at the real estate footprint of entities like Amazon, for example, or Google and the facilities they have around the world, you start to realize that they literally possess and operate more real estate than many of the largest, or many of the smaller countries in the world that you would recognize. And so, I don't know if, if anyone's read you know, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, but you start to see how this, this future hated vision of franchises becoming essentially sovereign, it, there doesn't seem to be that large of a gap between where we are and where he imagined things have been. And if that's the case, if a corporation becomes sovereign, it's what presents a decentralized organization become sovereign as well. Uh, and the last step is then gain diplomatic, diplomatic resolution. And there's a meme online where it's like, teach me how to draw an owl, and step one is draw a couple circles, and step two is draw the rest of the owl. Kind of feels like that's where we're going here. It's like the, step, the gap between step six and seven seems pretty large to me, but at the same time, if you simply just have access to that many people and the, the income they derive and the uh, real estate footprint that comes with those, then Maybe it is simply just the next step and petitioning your your favorite local government that is in favor of uh, abandoning whatever status quo they find disfavorable. So for example, like El Salvador using uh, Bitcoin as a national currency, um, it seems pretty odd. But you know, if that's uh, what they want to do to kind of get away from other constraints they find themselves in, then it works for the benefit of this uh, network state. 
Um, so this idea, the idea is that you're essentially populating the land from the cloud, that your network state is ideologically aligned but geographically decentralized, but then once the population economy of the society uh, become comparable to a legacy state, there is nothing that should preclude them from becoming a sovereign nation. And this doesn't necessarily have to be a jump from just straight networks or uh, network state or uh, social society to an absolute nation, but you can see that different steps can be taken, like simply negotiating lower taxes or citizenship, like you find with countries like Portugal and Cyprus offer means to, to purchase citizenship, uh, special economic zones that then lead into autonomous zones. Um, and then as far as like there's a non-cryptographic example, there's an organization called Plumia that's just simply trying to create what they call an internet company. You could argue that as a result it become, it's extremely centralized and then susceptible to a lot of the risks that um, would destabilize a nation state in the first place. But uh, as far as it means of doing it without getting involved with cryptocurrency or cryptographic protocols, uh, that's an example for that. And then. There's also, I think, 20 plus different network states being tracked at networkstate.com slash dashboard where people are attempting to literally try these same concepts at the moment. Um, so then there are some caveats that batteries in the book I define um, that I think kind of, well, at least it's good to be aware of. It. Um, so one, this assumes that the world is flipped to a digital first uh, footprint as opposed to physical first. He argues that much of human, human, human activity and humanity is online. Your work, socialization, even legal proceedings, political proceedings, uh, many previously offline devices such as cars and homes are becoming online devices as well. And so while the physical will still exist um, in terms of law enforcement and military functions and that a network state will require, for which a network state will require physical robots, but the idea is that in a nation state, everything physical is downstream of pieces of paper enforced by the police and military. The network state, everything is physical, is downstream of lines of code enforced by cryptography. Um, I think there's a lot of red flags in those caveats, but uh, caveat, yeah, or is it? Uh, oh, seize the day, caveat and purr. No, buy everywhere. That's. Um, so I, I think that, let me just see if, let me check something real quick, because I think that actually answers like a major question I had, uh -huh. like, like I was actually going to say like, for example, like take, if we take this to its limit, I could like drive a hundred miles and cross like 10 jurisdictions where the, you know, the speed limit, not just the speed limit is changing, but the driving age and the, you know, the, drunk driving limits or, you know, all kinds of things, right, that would, that I'd have to respond to in real time and know about every single jurisdiction as I'm coming in and out of it. I suppose there's, that's sort of maybe goes on in Europe right now a little bit, but like, you could almost drive 10 miles to go through 10 jurisdictions, I guess. If it, is, is the idea here that, like, that would be mitigated by the fact that, in this case, the fact that I'm not doing the driving, and my car just sort of responds to the contracts as it enters these jurisdictions and moves or something like that. And that there's just going to be enough of that, and there won't be a problem. Is, is that kind of where he's going? I think so. I mean, you can imagine like uh, you know, it's like iRobot, a Minority Report, to where humans don't even drive, and then he's having to escape the car because the car is trying to arrest him. You could experiences like in Snow Crash, to where you're. As you go in different territories, robots and AIs are taking effect of action. So I guess the, in those ways, that can be enforced in that, in that regard. But um, I don't think, at least as far as I know, it's not particularly prescribed. But um, I, I think that's the idea is that, yeah, somehow you get to the point to where it's AI and it's cryptographically enforced. And you won't have to worry about it. Got it. At least in some indefinite future. As to current implementations, then I think you'd have to deal with constraints with how things are at the moment. Um, okay, I've got a couple slides left. We'll go through these quickly, but a quick couple examples um, that they give in the book was uh, for an example of lifestyle immersion. So an example that requires maybe a network archipelago, a physical print, footprint, but not necessarily full network state diplomatic record recognition, which calls the keto kosher, 
a sugar-free society. So the founder reads the history of the USDA food pyramid and other regulatory grievances they might have, form a society around escaping that influence, you crowd from properties around the world, including things like small towns, and then you utilize consensus mechanisms and physical enforcement to ban processed foods and sugar at the border. You can extend that to setting cultural defaults for fitness and exercise. You can use purchasing power to bulk purchase continuous glucose monitors, etc. Uh, I think you could scale that up and down, uh, and then you can also change it for you know whatever sort of lifestyle you're looking for. And obviously, as people want to follow that, and that network stay with them grow. But you would probably, in this term, the goal is never to get to sovereign status, so they would probably never pursue it that far. Uh, the other example he gives that would require more sovereignty. Uh, I don't know if he necessarily requires full diplomatic recognition, as he talks about here, but the idea is that you want to have a medical sovereignty zone, similar to an economic or special economic zone, where an area where FDA rules and regulations are enforced in order to pursue experimental innovative treatments that um, haven't passed current regulatory processes. Um, so in this case, he says, you know, find your start society with the history of FDA-caused drug lag and FDA interference, and identify that 30% of every dollar spent is regulated by unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats, uh, and then make clear to all new members why your cause of medical, medical sovereignty is righteous. Outside the United States, your startup society could ride behind the coattails of a smaller country, like, for example, Malta's equivalent of the FDA, uh, to form a biomedical regime, and with the United States, find a governor or a city mayor of a powerful city who would declare a sanctuary site or state for biomedicine, where, uh, just like a sanctuary city won't, government won't enforce federal immigration law, a sanctuary state for biomedicine would enforce FDA regulations. Um, there's a lot to unpackage there, and if you find his critiques about the FDA and stuff, I think you give credence to why he feels this way. It's certainly an interesting example. Um, I know there's definitely prevalent cases of like medical tourism to where you go out of the country for medical procedures that either aren't available here or infeasibly expensive. Um, so yeah, my last slide I have is problems with the questions. And these are just kind of red flags that have come up on my, oh, not cool. I have a priorities meeting. Well, that's good to know. Um, so some questions I had is like, there seems to be no thought for family or household units within these concepts. Like it's pretty much like you're a digital nomad, you have one bag and your laptop and you can pack up and go. Um, key management, security, and privacy are all left as exercise for the reader, which is awesome, of course. Like, uh, I don't know if anyone saw earlier this week or last week where one of the original developers of Bitcoin lost all his Bitcoin because his key got stolen. So that's, like these are not trivial problems, but they're pretty hand waved away. Uh, network list of Ithin seems to have fundamental weaknesses. There's an example he gives that crypto com economy is greater than the fiat economy. But then, for example, prevents any large government from simply seizing or acquiring large amounts of either the mining equipment or the currency for proof of stake, and then manipulate the currency to drive the success down to zero. I think the counter argument to that might be you simply form another cryptocurrency and you have so many that the state, while they can actually go through and destroy a set number of them, they can't destroy all of them. And I think that goes along with the argument that Rubber, rubber hose cryptography or using the threat of physical punishment to uh, attain private keys from individuals simply doesn't scale on this argument, or as he argues. Uh, another question I've had is, you know, why is the founder so important? I think it's like kind of what Kirk B or Matt was talking about. Uh, so why is it important to have a recognized founder? I think it probably makes things easier, but again, I'm not sure it's a strict requirement. Um, how does it not become What's that? It was the Tom Cruise movie or Matt Damon, LCM or something, to where it's simply a society that only incorporates the wealthy and everyone's left out, who can't simply afford it or can't be connected for whatever means. Uh, another question is, what happens, like, if the idea is that you want to have the ultimate exit of society in order to choose, what happens when everyone exits the United States? This is just power vacuum, who gets the nuclear bombs, the keys to the Air Force kind of thing. So... Um, I think the book raises tons of questions more than it probably actually answers, but um, I thought it was really interesting. I actually still need to continue reading it in depth. I was hoping to do it over Christmas break, and then kids got sick, and that's great. Um, but I, yeah, the book is for free on the networksdude.com. It's currently in V1. I think he's using proceeds from sales, the physical copy, to continue editing and modifying it. So it will continue to be updated going forward. Um, 
Yeah, that is my summary of the network state. And if you don't like it, I would love to see an update on this later and come back and talk about it more. Cool. Any questions? Uh, what, what's in it for the customer? Right, right. Like, what, like, reduce taxes is kind of the best thing I've thought so far. Well, in terms of like, I think like the, the medical sovereignty ones, there's, if there's experimental treatment, for example, the FDA simply doesn't allow or regulate, or maybe even not just experimental treatments. The idea is that if the FDA has absolute control over not even just the United States, but if you look at what they call harmonization of regulation, and not the FDA alone does this, but things like FAA for aviation, a lot of companies will simply outsource and say, you know, in Croatia, like, if it's good enough for the FAA, then the airplane can fly here too. So the FDA and these other uh, bureaucratic agencies tend to have much larger scope and ambition than, I mean, not ambition, but um, jurisdiction, in, I guess implicit jurisdiction over these different realms. But our monopoly is good, and you, he argues that there's many instances that you can find where people have actually died as a result of FDA not continuing or experimenting going quicker. So his idea is that if you have a means to opt out of something else, it provides competition in the market, you have alternative regulators. So the idea is not to have no regulation. The argument is not that regulation in and of itself is bad, but the fact that you have no competition, no way to opt out, um, leads to poorer outcomes. And by having alternatives and competitions in a marketplace of regulation, that you then have better outcomes. And another example he gives in terms of like Uber and Lyft, and they're in terms regulators of their market, just like neighbors are regulated of our market. If you don't like Lyft, you think you rated the driver poorly, but it continues to drive in that market, you can then opt out and go somewhere else. Um, and I think you can then take that instead of FDA, it could be taxes or, uh, I don't know, environmental concerns. That has a lot of externalities though, so I don't know, something else. It may also be that, because um, these, are, these are happening, it, it starts off with a community, an online community that has a shared set, a shared set of values, right? And, uh, and those values are determined by that community. And the only way they're enforced now is just by communicating, right? If somebody comes in and violates the value, let's say you have the rationalist community, for example, and the rationalist community, somebody comes in and just starts spouting propaganda and not using rational arguments, then they're going to regulate that by pointing out, hey, that's propaganda, and eventually if they're spamming propaganda, then they get banned from the community, right? It's that kind of thing. It's, it, when you say what's the value, it depends on the, uh, it depends on the people who, I, I think it comes down to the people are creating a nation state like this or, or a network state like this because they don't feel their existing states are, are uh, fulfilling the need for whatever that value is. You know, that's, I, it's, so that's broad, it's very abstract, but I, that's why these get created, that's why any community gets created, really. It's because they don't think that their, their existing community, the reason I joined this community over here is because my existing community doesn't value the same things. They may value other things I value as well, but they don't value fully, and so, so you try to become part of all the similar communities. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's also, he's sort of making the statement that, like, some of these technologies like cryptocurrency and the internet are doing the same thing for making a nation state that like cloud and mobile did for creating a startup. Like cloud and like it used to be, when eBay and Amazon started, it took you know hundreds of millions of dollars just to you know build a data center and acquire you know buy Super Bowl commercials and, and things like that. And like and now you can create tiny startups, right? And because of you know cloud computing and digital advertising, and you know everyone has a computer in their pocket. And I guess like it seems like that's the thesis, right? It's like this could create like the opportunity to create micro states the way you can create micro companies now. And so and and so people will. It's sort of like they will. They'll do it because they can. I heard him describe uh, Discord as a great place to start a, a nation state, or at least for a nation state to be communicating. Discord is a place to go, which that's what's happening on Discord, is these separate different communities are being created there for, for whatever purpose people are creating them for. The other thought I had on this, though, was like, neighbor is like a bit on the other side of this, right? Like. At least for part of this, like neighbor, I think neighbors sort of 
mega political philosophy is that like one of the things that is best for society is to start to connect with the people that are physically next to us more. Yep. I mean, I think you could argue that is the ideological alignment behind it. Um, and so that in that one, in that case, if I, neighbor becomes, like the idea is that neighbor then becomes a network state, you wouldn't necessarily have the uh, accumulation of congregation of everyone physically. The idea is that you would form those archipelagos where you stand. Is that kind of what you, you're saying as, I guess, on, on the other end of the spectrum there? Uh, so we cut out a little there, but like, I think you were saying that like, I, I didn't quite catch it. I, it sounded like you're saying that like, the, the goal of this is to bring people together that have similar ideas. Is that, is that kind of where you were going? Yeah, I, I guess I was just trying to think about how a network state from neighbor's perspective would work. So I think, I think Matt, you were saying that um, this seems to be the opposite of that because neighbor's about creating communities with all the diversity of opinion and values that exists yeah. in that community, where you stand, not not the network part. But I would even argue the network part would be um, what all the network state of neighbor would be interested in is making sure that they can do what they want with their property by making it available to their neighbor, which maybe the existing states won't allow for that. And so we need to figure out a way to collectively group and to, and to add that kind of uh, sovereignty to say, yes, we want to be able to do that. Yeah, that's an interesting take as well. Like, I, I, that's why I try to be very careful to say, just an aspect of this is at odds with networks, with uh, with neighbors sort of overriding philosophy, which is like, you, you sort of like, live where you stand and like make the, make the community that you're at work, right? Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Things to think about. All right, Mind Garden two weeks. I think we still need people to sign up, so if you have something you want to talk about, then let's do it.